What was it like being a woman in the science field when you first presented your findings? It was, uh, it was interesting. There were those scientists who felt reluctant to believe in the information that was provided by this young woman. But remember, on, you know, if you're thinking from their perspective, I didn't even have a degree when I began. So it, was, uh, it wasn't a bit surprising that they said, well, maybe, pff, why should we believe all this? Maybe it's not true. But fortunately, uh, once the National Geographic came in, they sent Hugo van Lauwek out and he photographed all the things I talked about, so everybody had to believe in them. And how did Leakey play a role in this? Did he always back up your findings? Louis Leakey was the one who had faith that I could do it. Uh, even though I had no degree, he said actually, he told me later that he was looking for somebody whose mind wasn't cluttered up with the reductionist theory of the of the animal behavior people of that time, and it was very reductionist. And so he picked me, but not telling me, so that it was a bit of a shock when I got to Cambridge and was told I'd done everything all wrong. You have to remember, too, I didn't go into this endeavor with any expectation of being a scientist. I just wanted to be a naturalist and go out to Africa and live with animals and write books about them. So. Uh, and I was always very lucky because once the National Geographic stepped in, I was, I didn't have to worry about academia and I wasn't trying to get some kind of job in a university and since I was funded to do my research by the Geographic, I thought, well, I think I'm doing it okay, so if they want to do it differently, let them do it differently, that's fine. And what was the response of other scientists knowing that you actually named the chimps? You know, naming helped me to remember who was who. I mean, I hate numbers. There's no way I would have remembered number 12, number 14, number 17. And quite honestly, I don't think most people would. You know, I went, the first time I ever went to South Korea, uh, a young woman came up to me in the street. I hadn't been on TV or anything, but she'd seen a geographic film and she had tears in her eyes. She said, I never thought I'd see you. And can you tell me, how's Fifi? Do you think she would have said with tears in her eyes, how's number 18? I don't think so. So the naming of them kind of cemented the personality. And people have said, oh, it was so, so good you gave them personalities. I didn't give them personalities. I tried to describe the personalities that, that I learned. Um, Dr. Jane, uh, leadership in the chimpanzee community is something that you've spent many years observing and we're quite keen to hear about how uh, chimpanzees and the, the different strategies that they use to actually make their leadership really apparent in their community. I think learning how the different males became leaders has been one of the really fascinating aspects and first of all there are two kinds of leaders. There's the one who gets there because he's big and he's strong and he's aggressive and he rules by brute force and through fear. Not all the time, it's not quite that extreme, but, but basically that's how he is. And then there are the ones who are uh, less aggressive, less dominant to start with, uh, before they begin their uh, you know, effort to get to the top. And they get to the top by using their brains, by strategizing and particularly by forming alliances. So a perfect example of the first kind of male was one that I named Humphrey. And he was very big and he was extremely aggressive. He was almost, you know, he was very unusually aggressive, particularly towards females. And the alpha male whom he supp supplanted was aging. And I think Humphrey could have actually challenged and overcome him several years earlier, but you know, in chimpanzee society, like a lot of humans, it's uh, you, you accept the norm and you carry on because that's the, that's the way it is. But anyway, one day Humphrey dared to attack Mike and uh, Humphrey took over as top ranking male, but he only survived as top for one and a half years because, you know, he didn't have any allies. Um, he wasn't particularly bright, he was all brawn and little brain. And he was overthrown by a much younger, much less aggressive male whose, uh, his, his strategy was to form a very close alliance with his older brother 
and Figgin would only challenge Humphrey when his older brother was around, and then the two of them would display together and Humphrey uh, would, would retreat. And Fig but Figgin, in addition to having the support of his older brother, he had these clever strategies like um, getting up very early in the morning when there's a big group in the trees all lying in their nests and Figgin would kind of creep up high and then he'd start this wild display shaking the branches and leaping about and there would be chimpanzees raining down onto the ground and screaming and that intimidated Humphrey too. Flo is quite an interesting um, chimpanzee in your study and appeared to be quite a, an assertive female chimpanzee. Can you tell us a little bit about her? Well, Flo was a, you know, the females do not have a clear-cut dominance hierarchy like the males. So with the males, there's nearly always a number one, and then they are two, three, four, five, with a few hiccups because number three might be more dominant than number two if he's with number seven or something like that. With the females, it's very different, and you have some females who are very high-ranking, um, a whole lot who are middle ranking and some who are very, very low ranking. And Flo was assertive, aggressive. She was incredibly successful as a mother. She was usually accompanied by at least one of her adolescent sons, which gave her a big advantage over other females who might be accompanied only by an adolescent daughter or something like that. She was uh, affectionate, she was playful, and it, you know, it's very clear there are good chimp mothers and bad chimp mothers, just as in human society. And the offspring of the good mothers do much, much better mothers. The males rise to a higher rank and therefore sire more children. And uh, the, the offspring of the less good mothers tend to have difficulty forming relaxed relationships with, with the others as they grow adult. I was very interested in the difference between Freud and Frodo as the dominant males in the group, especially that Frodo fathered more chimps and was a lot more aggressive. What's the difference in their leadership styles? F Freud, uh, during, during his um, childhood and adolescence, was inseparable from Frodo. They were always together. And Freud would support his younger brother, Frodo. And then, as he began moving up, uh, obviously he set his sights on this alpha position, which he really will work for. Uh, then he began to, he set up a systematic effort to intimidate Frodo. And he succeeded to such an extent that, we, you know, we were really sorry for Frodo. Frodo was a little brat. He was a bully from the beginning and not a nice person at all. Um, shouldn't have named him Frodo from Lord of the Rings. I love Frodo in Lord of the Rings, but we didn't know that Frodo would turn out to be such a, such a, such a brat. But um, he became increasingly terrified of Freud. And there was one occasion I remember very well when uh, Freud came displaying into, the, uh, into this area and Freud, uh, Frodo rushed up a palm tree. And Frodo very, uh, sorry, I start that one again. There was one occasion that I remember really well when Frodo was uh, in the feeding area and Freud arrived and he did one of these dramatic displays and Frodo rushed up the palm tree screaming fearfully. And Freud, having finished his display, kind of looked around, looked up at his young brother who was just sitting up there whimpering and he then sat beneath the palm tree with his ally, Jomeo, and they groomed each other for one whole hour with Frodo pinned up in the tree and whimpering and not daring to come down until Freud had left. So, okay, so Freud got him totally terrorized. Then he made his bid and got the, the alpha position and maintained it in a very laid back, very relaxed, a, a real leader. The others liked to follow him. Uh, he was a good guy. And he reigned for about six years. And then he became very sick. And while he was very sick, that was the opportunity to Frodo, for Frodo to get back at him. And we actually thought Frodo was going to kill him, but he didn't. And then Frodo took over as top-ranking male. And the two brothers, they didn't really have anything much to do with each other. 
for quite a long time. They do now. And how did Ferdinand transition to become the alpha male? What happened was that uh, Frodo lost his alpha position again when he was sick. Then there was about a two-year period when there was no clear-cut alphas. First one of the younger males and then another. There was Sheldon and there was Tooby. And uh, meanwhile, Ferdinand was getting very big and very strong and looking very like Frodo and actually spending quite a bit of time with Frodo. And then he just, a, a bit like Humphrey, you know, he was big and strong and aggressive, but brighter than Humphrey, being one of the F family. So he challenged the, the then Alpha and has just taken over and he's undisputed Alpha. How long he'll last, we don't know. Now, we've talked a little bit about the Alpha males. What happens to the displaced Alpha male when he's been ousted from his position? It differs. When Mike was displaced, it was like, oh, I don't have to keep up this effort anymore. And he just sank back into a fairly low position within the hierarchy, no problem. Uh, just, you know, did this submissive pant grunt to Humphrey, and that was it. Whereas when, uh, when Humphrey lost his alpha position, he was ostracized. He went right out of the community, and every time he came back, there was a coalition of males challenging him. It's because they didn't like him. And eventually, he was able to come back. Um, one of the areas we were quite keen to hear about is how the chimpanzees actually, the leading chimpanzees, were able to exert their influence and get the messages through to the chimpanzee community. What did they do? How did they get their messages through to the rest of the community? Well, there are two, there's something important here, and that is that the way we use leader doesn't quite work that way in chimp society. We have an alpha who uh, may on some occasions lead, uh, he may lead a patrol to protect the, you know, to patrol the boundary of the territory, uh, and the others may or may not follow him. And there are others who are leaders because they're good guys, and they may be fairly low ranking, but you may see when they move off, a whole, a whole group will follow them, and they're going to go and find good food, and they're going to go and, you know, hang out together in a peaceful sort of way. So you can't equate the top male necessarily with the leader. On the other hand, when you have um, an alpha like Freud, his uh, brother Figgen, when he was alpha, um, the, the others choose to follow them. And so the alpha, alpha and the leader position are the same. Yeah. Jane, when you lived in close proximity to the chimp community, do you think the leader ever saw you as a challenge? There's no way they could see me as a challenge. First of all, I never tried to make any attempt to be part of their society. Yes, in the early days I groomed some of them, and that was something I wouldn't have given up for anything because they'd been running away from me for some of them for over a year. And to get their trust so that they would actually allow me to groom them, there was not many of them, but the ones I did. You know, this was something that was so important in my ongoing uh, relationship to the study as a whole. So, but after that, real, that, realizing the study could continue, that students would come in, that chimps are much bigger than us and could be dangerous, so pulled back. And uh, we've never in the wild made any attempt to communicate with them except that bit of grooming I did. And Fifi and Fig and I could tickle. David Gray was the first chimp to show you that he was making tools. How did he communicate this to other chimps? There's no way we can know. We don't know David Greybeard's childhood. We don't know if he had some kind of uh, different uh, experience with humans when he was young. We just don't know. But they do all have their different personalities. And David was gentle, laid back. Uh, and he just began to lose his fear. He'd often been seen sitting in trees above the, the, uh, where the fishermen camped. So he always had less fear of people, clearly. And so he came into my camp one day, I wasn't there, and he took some bananas. So I asked the cook, Dominic, to leave them out if he came again. The reason he came was a palm tree was ripe. Uh, but even when the palm tree stopped fruiting after about uh, a week, 
he still came back in case there were bananas. And I stayed down, because I used to go up every single day into the mountains. But I thought, I must see who this chimpanzee is. And lo and behold, it was the one I'd already named because of this beautiful white beard that he had. And so when I approached a group and they were ready to flee, you know, because that's what they always did. But if David was there, they'd kind of look at him and look at me and look back at him and think, well, she can't be so dangerous. So he really helped me into this magic world of the wild chimpanzees. And gradually I got to know his, his friends. And was he actually a leader within the community? Well, he was a leader in that he was the one who led other chimps to my camp. He was not at all an alpha. His uh, best friend, Goliath, was a very strong alpha. Um, and it was interesting that when Goliath was challenged, this strong, fairly aggressive male, uh, he would seek out David Greybeard just because David Greybeard was so calming. And, you know, he would spend hours grooming David and then he'd build up his courage to go back and face the other males, which is like the adolescent male does with his mother. How did the science world respond to the issue of feeding chimps bananas close to your campground? It's possible that because of the bananas, a group that I think when I first got there, I think they were possibly beginning to split into two groups, just because it was there were far more adult males than we've ever seen since. And I think that made a lot of tensions. Um, but because of the bananas, the group that was more often in the south, began coming more often to the north. So I think it delayed a split, but I have no way of telling if that's true. That was just what I felt. Yeah. And the fortunate thing is this all happened before the big, what I call the four years war, yeah. when the males of the uh, Kasekela community uh, invaded the newly demarcated territory of the southern group that split off. Uh, four years after the split, we saw the first really fierce attacks. And thank goodness it wasn't the other way around because the, 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 um, the big group still had the banana feeding and the others had left and were not coming back looking for bananas. That would have been terrible because then I would have felt responsible for them being killed. But they weren't. They'd moved off south. And I think the reason was that these, uh, the larger group in the north had previously had access to that area in the south and there were certain foods there and they just after a bit decided they're going to reclaim it which is what they did. Jane I've heard you talk about the disconnect between the human brain which is powerful enough to send us to the moon and the human heart and that got me thinking about our global political leadership. What do you think about that? Well I think I should start off by saying it's not just the politicians. I mean, all of us. Think of, think of uh, the wisdom of indigenous people who made a decision based on how will the decision we make today affect our people generations ahead. And in those days, there were wise leaders. And today, you know, it's so easy to blame the politicians for everything, but it's a job to be a politician, and your job is to get re-elected. So if we, the people, can support the politicians who are strong enough to stand out against the prevailing, uh, you know, everything's the bottom line, everything's money, and we only do things if it's going to improve the economy and things like that. But if there's enough people who say, this isn't working, we can't afford to have unlimited economic growth. There isn't enough, there are not enough, um, you know, non-renewable resources on the planet, we're running out of them. If everybody has the standard of living of probably all of us in this room, we need between three and six new planets to provide those resources. And we only have one. So, uh, you know, it, it's in a democracy, then it's got to be the people who make change. I really believe that. And that's why I'm so passionate about our youth program, because the young people get it. The young people are influencing their parents. The young people are going to go out and be the next uh, fathers and mothers and teachers and lawyers and doctors and politicians. And they'll share a philosophy 
which says, yeah, we need money to live, but we mustn't live for money. That's what's wrong with the world today. Everybody's living for money. Everybody wants more and more stuff. Everybody works harder and harder to get more and more stuff, way more than they need, and often more than they actually want. We've just got to learn that life on this planet is interconnected. And as we start eliminating one species after another, after another in what's been called the sixth great extinction, then the future for our children is pretty grim. And you hear this little phrase, we haven't inherited this planet from our parents, we've borrowed it from our children. But we haven't borrowed, we've stolen. We've stolen and stolen and stolen. And some of what we've stolen can never be repaid because it's gone. And so, you know, if you think of the big difference between us and chimpanzees and other creatures, it is this explosive development of the intellect which has taken us to the moon. But you can't equate uh, the clever intellect with wisdom. And the wisdom is thinking about what we do now and how it's going to affect the future. And that's where is the disconnect between the clever brain and love and compassion of the human heart. Jane, that neatly brings us to the work that your foundation is doing as far as youth programs, etc. are concerned. And we know that you're in many countries around the world, but just wonder whether or not you could elaborate about the work your foundation is putting in place right now and what you have coming up for you at the moment. Well, uh, the Jane Goodall Institute was started in 1977 and it's now spread. There are 27 of them, 27 different countries. And we are still maintaining the research at Gombe, which had its 50th anniversary last July. And we close it this July. I'll be back in Tanzania for that. Uh, we, we also support some other research on chimpanzees. We are very passionate about trying to protect chimpanzees and the other great apes and the rainforest. And by protecting the rainforest, we, of course, are um, helping conservation for all the other things which live in this most, um, you, you know, rich in biodiversity, the rainforest. We have special projects and campaigns, a campaign which all the JGIs are involved in now is Chimponga, which is a sanctuary for chimpanzees orphaned by the bushmeat trade, which is the commercial hunting of wild animals for food. And it's very different from subsistence hunting. It is not to feed mm -hmm. starving people. Urban elite will pay more for uh, these. Are, it, it can be elephants, gorillas, chimpanzees, birds, bats, antelopes, monkeys, whatever, cut up and um, you know, smoked and sent into the urban areas and shipped overseas too as bushmeat. And it is absolutely unsustainable. The people living in and around the, the forest, like the pygmies, uh, are going to have their, well, they've already had their future made pretty grim, made possible by foreign logging companies going in and opening up the forests with roads. So we're looking after now 150 orphan chimpanzees Almost all had their mothers killed for bushmeat. Over half are now adult. We have to move them from the sanctuary that was built uh, back in the early 90s, but it wasn't built for 150. And the conditions there are absolutely not what we, what we, what we like. But you know, we have to get the money. And so we now have three beautiful big islands on the Quilu River, which is a glorious river. Uh, like the African Queen River. And so we have to get the money for the infrastructure. We need some boats. We have to be able to care for the chimps on the islands. They get a lot of food, but not all of it. Mm -hmm. So that's one big major campaign tied up with trying to do what we can about the bushmeat um, and, you know, working to find alternative ways of living for the hunters and so forth, to alternative protein sources. Then there's also a campaign uh, which is important for Australia because it's the orangutans and that's the nearest great ape to you in the Indonesian rainforests. And the campaign that JGI Australia is, is uh, heading up is to collect disused old, old cell phones 
because in the cell phone is a mineral called coltan, and coltan is mined in eastern Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and it's, uh, it involves slavery, it involves uh, horrible cruelty to people, but it also involves uh, a complete destruction of the forest as they look for these, this mineral, and they hunt every animal that's there to eat because there's nothing else to eat. So collecting up old cell phones, very important. Working right now to try and get palm oil labeled, that's really important and it shouldn't be just Australia, it should be far wider than that because as the palm oil plantations uh, su uh, supplant the, the rainforest, so the orangutans lose their habitat and you know they're, they're probably almost the most endangered of the great apes. And then on top of all of this, we have our youth program, and that's Roots and Shoots. Mm -hmm. And Roots and Shoots began with 12 high school students 20 years ago in Tanzania. It now has members from preschool all through university, with more and more adults taking part. And uh, they, we have the program now in 127 countries, including New Zealand mm -hmm. and Australia. And every group chooses three projects to make the world better. One, to help people. It could be the victims of the earthquakes in Christchurch. It could be Roots and Shoots groups all over England trying to help those people or the victims of tsunami or those in Japan. Or it could be homeless people in your own community in soup kitchens and so forth. And then a project to help animals, which could be uh, trying to help protect a an endangered species, um, like one of Phil Bishop's frogs, yes. uh, learning about them, talking about them, trying to change opinion, learning how to write letters and lobby. Or it could be to help domestic animals, like dogs in shelters or stray dogs, or the cattle. You've heard all about the cattle going off to Indonesia. I don't know about New Zealand sheep, but I suspect some nasty things happen to them as well. So it could be that. And then the final one is to, you know, help the environment. And you can, if you're clever, put all three in one. It, it can be just one big project. And the most important message is every single individual makes a difference every single day. And we have a choice as to what sort of difference we want to make. And we link these young people up. And we have youth, uh, Roots and Shoots Youth Leadership Councils and we bring them together across the country, across the world. Wonderful. Dr. Jane Goodall, on behalf of Frog Recruitment, thank you so much for your time and insight tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Nicole. We are delighted to have met you, and we wish you well with the Year of the Forest this year, I believe. Yes. And with all of your work. Um, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.